Thanks, Nir. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, patchable indistinguishability of location, which we, which is called I/O for evolving software, and this is in joint work with uh, Abhishek and Amit. Ah, okay. So every software in its lifetime undergoes numerous changes, and uh, these changes are modeled as patches, which the company regularly publishes on their website. The users can download these patches and apply to their uh, local copies of software. So why does software evolve, right? So there are many reasons. For instance, the hardware requirements can change over time. Uh, there could be changes in the functionality requirements. Uh, you want to add more features to the software, change the GUI, and so on. Another reason is to resolve compatibility issues. Uh, you want to make sure your software is compatible with the latest version of operating system. And another reason could be that you want to fix some bugs in the software. So in this, in this work, we deal with uh, software evolution. So let, let's see how to model uh, the notion of evolving software. So we, have an, uh, we model the software as Turing machines. So there is a machine M. Um, and there is an update algorithm that takes this Turing machine M along with the patch P and uh, produces a new machine M prime. Okay. So the size of M prime could be uh, uh, unrelated to the size of M. It could be much larger than the size of M, or it could be much smaller, and so on. And the goal of this work is to um, protect evolving software, uh, meaning that there are two main uh, sub-goals that we have to achieve. One is to protect, one is to achieve privacy of the software, and another is a functionality requirement where we want to ensure that uh, the software can be updated over a period of time while ensuring privacy of software. Okay. okay, so in this work, we uh, define the notion of I.O. for evolving software, which we call uh, patchable I.O. Okay. So before I define the notion of patchable I.O., uh, let's see why doesn't the standard I.O. for uh, Turing machines doesn't itself suffice to get I.O. for evolving software. Uh, so let's just consider a simple scenario. So Apple wants to uh, send, uh, send the software to the user. Uh, so it wants to make sure that uh, uh, it protects the software from the user. So it obfuscates the software first and then sends it to the user. And later on, uh, it wants to update the software. Uh, so it publishes a patch P. And it uses patch P to uh, update its software locally to get a new machine, new software M prime. And now Apple can. Uh, essentially obfuscate this new software and uh, send this obfuscated software to the user. Right? So this, this solution uh, ensures that uh, uh, you can actually change software over a period of time, and at the same time, you protect uh, the privacy of the software from the user. Right? So what is the problem with this naive solution? So during every patch, patching phase, uh, the communication complexity uh, from Apple to the user now depends on the size of the, uh, on the updated software. Right? So uh, this software could be of several gigabytes of size, and so the communication complexity during every patching would be several gigabytes. And this is not very reasonable. So in order to sort of handle this, uh, uh, this issue, we define the notion of patchable I.O., in particular, we want this uh, efficiency requirement that the communication complexity during the patching phase should be proportional to the size of the patch. Right. Okay. Right. So let me define this notion. Uh, as before, as in the case of uh, standard I.O. for Turing machines, there is uh, the obfuscation algorithm that lets you obfuscate uh, Turing machines. In addition, you have this generation patch algorithm that takes as input a patch P and outputs uh, an encoding of P. Okay. So you should think of this encoding of P uh, as protecting the, the patch. Right? So it's some form of encryption of P. And Apple essentially sends this uh, encoding of P to the user who runs an apply patch algorithm on the original uh, obfuscated Turing machine M along with the secure patch P, to get uh, an obfuscation of the new machine M prime. Okay. 
So gen patch and the apply patch algorithms are uh, what is different from the standard uh, definition of IO for Turing machine. Okay. And as I said earlier, uh, size of M prime could be much larger or smaller than M, so it is unrelated to the size of the original machine. Okay, so before I uh, deal with this notion in more detail, let's talk about some definitional issues that arise. So the first thing is that what is the patching process? I mean, how do we apply patches, right? Uh, as uh, as if, you have a, if you attended Aloni's talk in the morning, uh, in, the, in the case of updatable cryptography, there too we consider this notion of sequential patching, where initially you have a Turing machine M, uh, and uh, you're going to apply patches, patches sequentially to this original Turing machine. Right, so uh, you have initially P1 that you apply on M0 to get Turing machine M1, and then you get a new patch which you apply on M1 to get a new Turing machine and so on. Okay. And the second uh, definitional issue is how many patches do we handle? So ideally, we want to uh, handle unbounded number of patches. In particular, we want to make sure that the parameters of the system does not depend on the number of patches that we handle. Right? And we achieve this, uh, this, this sort of uh, efficiency requirement. Okay? And the third issue is patching multiple programs. So suppose, let's say, uh, Apple issues personalized software to all its users. So each user has it, has it has a software of Apple that is tailor-made to his requirement, his or her requirements. So now at a later point of time, Apple wants to publish a patch that can uh, patch all the individualized softwares. So it wants to issue one single patch that can change all the uh, individualized softwares. Right? And uh, to deal with this, we need to come up with a notion where uh, Apple can actually issue encoded one encoded patch that it can put on the bulletin board, and all the users can look at this encoded patch and apply it to their copies, and they should be able to uh, ultimately obtain like uh, an obfuscation of their uh, individualized software. Okay. So this notion of uh, providing the ability to patch multiple programs is what we call multi-program patch volume. So let me just summarize the requirements that I've stated so far. Uh, the first main requirement is that the patch encoding size should only depend on the path size. And the second requirement is that the patches should be, uh, should be able to modify the programs arbitrarily using the patches. Okay. And the third requirement is it should be able to handle unbounded number of patches. Uh, and the final requirement is that you should be able to patch multiple programs using the same patch. So now let me talk about correctness and security definitions. So this is the formal correctness requirement. Um, so suppose, let's say, you start with the Turing machine M0, and you have a sequence of patches P1 to PL. Okay? So let's consider two scenarios. In the first scenario, you patch, you apply the sequence of patches to the Turing machine M0, and you will get all these path machines M1 to ML. And then you obfuscate these machines M1 to ML. Okay? So this is the first scenario. In the second scenario, you're going to obfuscate the machine M0, and you're going to encode the patches P1 to PL. And then you're going to run the apply patch algorithm on all these encoded patches and the original Turing machine M0. Okay? And in the end, you get a sequence of obfuscated Turing machines M1 to ML. Okay? So this is the second scenario. We want that both the scenarios are equivalent. Stating this in a more simple manner, whether you patch the Turing machine and then obfuscate the resulting Turing machines should be the same as obfuscating the uh, Turing machines and then running the apply patch algorithm. OK. And the security requirement is, uh, is a generalization of I.O. Uh, again, you have uh, two worlds here. There is a world corresponding to uh, challenge bit 0, and there is a world corresponding to challenge bit 1. Uh, let me call this left and right worlds. So in the left world, you have uh, machine M0, and you have a sequence of patches 
uh, that are parameterized by uh, challenge bit zero. And in the right world, you have machine M1, and you have a sequence of patches that are parameterized by bit one. So now, as long as the set of path machines that you get from the left world and the right world are equivalent, the adversary should not be able to distinguish whether uh, the challenger obfuscated the uh, machine as well as encoded the patches in the left world or from the right world. Okay? So this is, the, this is the security requirement. Okay. And here I, I was only considering the single program setting where you start with one program and apply a sequence of patches to this one program. But you can also consider the multi-program setting where there are many, many Turing machines to begin with and you apply a sequence of patches to all these uh, uh, Turing machines. Okay. And I'm not going to define this, uh, these two notions uh, uh, in this talk. Okay, so let me state our results. Uh, assuming sub-exponential I.O. for circuits and sub-exponential uh, DDH, we get uh, multi-program patchable I.O. for Turing machines. Here I want to mention that uh, the notion of I.O. for Turing machines uh, has this caveat that the input length to the Turing machine should be fixed a priori. And the parameters of the system grows with this input length. So in the paper, we also consider other uh, patching process. Uh, the one I described was sequential. You can also think about parallel, some tree-based patching processes that I'm not going to talk about uh, in this talk. So this notion of uh, uh, considering cryptographic primitives in the uh, updatability con context is not new. And this has been studied under the banner of incremental cryptography. Uh, there is incremental signatures, encryption, and so on. And concurrently, uh, there was also this notion of incremental obfuscation uh, studied by Gurg and Pandey. The results they achieve is uh, different from ours. They, uh, in their case, the size of the Turing machine updated is the same as the size of the Turing machine that you begin with. And, uh, and on the other hand, they have better efficiency uh, properties, uh, unlike ours. Okay, so if you want to know about it in more detail, I can talk offline. So let me state the theoretical applications. So we can actually get a very, very simple construction of FE for Turing machines starting from uh, patchable IO. Okay? So the construction can be summarized in just one slide. Okay? So suppose, let's say, you want to generate a functional key for a Turing machine M. All you have to do is uh, obfuscate a Turing machine, inputless Turing machine, uh, that has hardwired into it a uh, message X. Okay? And this X initially is set to bot. And this obfuscated Turing machine will be the functional key. And now, if you want to encrypt a message Y, you will generate an update, uh, a generate, uh, uh, you will run the gen patch algorithm on a patch that sets X to Y. Okay. So this is the this is the encryption algorithm. So now, how do you evaluate the functional key on the ciphertext? You essentially run the apply patch algorithm on the Turing machine as well as the secure uh, encoding of the patch. And now you'll get a Turing machine that has, you'll get an obfuscation of a Turing machine that has Y hardwired inside it. Right? And this is an inputless Turing machine. You just run this uh, obfuscated Turing machine and then you'll get M of Y. That's it. Okay. Yeah, as I said, this is a simple construction and uh, if you if you are familiar with the previous construction, uh, this uh, it was more involved and it directly built from I/O for uh, circuits. Okay. okay, there are also other simple applications of patchable I/O, uh, such as multi-input function encryption for Turing machines, uh, and you can also get I/O for Turing machines with unbounded length input. However, you need a very strong form of patchable I/O that uh, that has this reusability property. And uh, we don't know how to achieve this, this, this notion of, uh, this strong notion of patchable I.O. Okay. Starting from just I.O. for circuits. Okay. okay, so let me give the technical details. So let me first lay out a simple template for, uh, for single program patchable I.O. And uh, we will modify this template as we identify the problems associated with it. Okay. 
Okay. So in order to generate an obfuscation of a Turing machine M, you're first going to encode M using an encoding scheme. Okay. And then you're also going to obfuscate a circuit that runs the decoding of this encoding algorithm. And this also runs the evaluation algorithm on the result of the decoding on an input X that is fed to this uh, obfuscated circuit. So the circuit takes as input N code of M and X, and it runs the decode algorithm, and then it uh, outputs M of X. Okay. So the evaluation is simple. So on input X, you're just going to run this obfuscated circuit, get M of X, and you're done. So the now, now the question is, what is this encoding scheme? What are the properties it needs to satisfy? Uh, we require that the encoding uh, scheme satisfies the following properties. It needs to satisfy correctness. Uh, hiding and patching properties. Okay. So firstly, we want that if you decode encode of, if you run the decoding algorithm on encode of M, then you should get M. Okay. And the second property is the hiding property. Whether I give you encoding of M0 or whether I give you encoding of M1, it should be indistinguishable from each other. And the final property is the patching property that you should be able to combine encoding of M and an encoding of patch P to get encoding of M prime. Okay, so we are going to call such an encoding scheme as a patchable encoding scheme. So there is a natural candidate to uh, construct this patchable encoding scheme. Uh, and this is fully homomorphic encryption. So this correctness of fully homomorphic encryption implies the correctness of this encoding scheme. And the hiding is, uh, is implied by the semantic security. And uh, the patching property is implied by the homomorphic evaluation, uh, correctness of homomorphic evaluation. OK, so the main problem with this, OK, so now that we have identified this patchable encoding scheme, so let's see the problems with this uh, template. The first problem is that the adversary can apply encoded patches of his choice. Right? So he can change this encoding M to whatever he wants. And this should clearly be uh, a problem. And a fix to this problem is uh, to authenticate the patches. So the, the evaluator should only be able to apply patches that are authenticated. Right? So let's make a second attempt to this template. So now in the, the encoding of M will be the same as before. The obfuscated circuit now takes us, uh, runs the following uh, steps. First, it's going to verify uh, the signature associated with uh, an encoding of the patch. Uh, this encoding of the patch and the signature is input to this obfuscated circuit. And then it runs the decode algorithm uh, to get the machine M. And then it runs the update algorithm to get the new machine M prime. And then it's going to uh, output the evaluation of M prime on X. So now, in order to generate a secure patch, you're going to encode this patch P, and you're going to uh, generate a signature on this encoding. So the main issue with this approach is that now the adversary can apply patches out of order. Right? So the, uh, the authority says, hey, apply patch P1 first, P2, and then P3. Of course, he signs all these patches. But the evaluator could be malicious, and you could apply patch 2 first, and then patch 1, patch 3, and so on. And there is no mechanism currently to deal with such an issue. Okay. And uh, the fix for this is not to authenticate the patches, but to authenticate the patched machine. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Note that if you patch P on M, you'll get M prime. right? So the authority now generates a signature of encoding of M prime as against encoding of P. So let's see the solution in more detail. So the obfuscation, initial obfuscation algorithm is the same as before. Apple is going to maintain the state encode of M and the uh, signing key. It is then going to generate the, the, the uh, update algorithm to get encode of M prime. And then it's going to sign the encode of M prime, and it's going to uh, send encoding of this patch along with the signature. So this is the basic template. And the problem with this approach is that the authority has to maintain a large state, right? It has to maintain the encoding of the software and the signing key. And this is fine. In any case, Apple has to maintain the software. However, it becomes a problem 
if it has to maintain uh, personalized software for all its users, right? So then the storage would depend on the number of users it has. And the solution to this problem is sort of reverse delegation. So instead of the client delegating something to the server, the server is going to delegate something to the client. So the uh, Apple is going to maintain the state at the user's end instead of maintaining it at its end. Okay. However, there are a couple of issues that we need to handle. The first issue is that this, this state contains secret information. Uh, and the second issue is that uh, if Apple doesn't have the state, how does it even generate the secure patches? Right? So it has already delegated to the client. And uh, in order to solve this, we are going to use a tool of uh, adaptive garbage Turing machines for persistent memory that have been studied by two prior works. Okay. And for some simpler updates, you can actually just use uh, one-way functions-based garbage drives. So in order to go from single program to multi-program, there are uh, other issues involved. I'm not going to talk about it in detail because of time constraints. Um, we need additional tools to solve this uh, step as well. So, so far we have just constructed a template for single program patch IO, uh, and we have, uh, we have seen how to go from single program to multi-program patch IO. So now the question is how to implement the template of single program patch IO. Uh, so this template requires some properties that we need to solve. We, we need to handle, for instance, what is the, how do we get this encoding of the Turing machine to be patchable and so on. And to do this, we are going to use a construction from uh, prior work uh, with uh, Abhishek and Amit. And this essentially satisfies this template. And there are uh, additional implementation issues that are tailor-made to this construction involved, which I'm not going to talk about uh, with the second slide. 